dot liver function test so whenever you go to any diagnostic lab pathology lab uh, the doctor tends to say that whenever you have some problem in digestion or anything in uh, in your blood glucose or some intestine problem so they say this LFT test go for LF uh, liver function test so we will discuss about this diagnosis how the value looks like and how it works out so liver is the largest organ of our body weighing around about 1.56 kg liver is also called kitchen of our body so in this mainly carbohydrate metabolism metabolism is taking place in a fat state uh, glycogen synthesis and x glucose is uh, it converted to fatty acids and tags which are incorporated to the uh, VLDL and transported to the adipose tissues so during the fasting your glucose concentration is maintained by the glucogenolysis and gluconeogenesis so these are two steps which will be done and then protein metabolism uh, is also helping in protein metabolism that is synthesis of albumin and various plasma proteins except immunoglobins so most of the coagulation factors like fibrinogen prothrombin factors like 2 5 7 9 10 11 12 and 13 so LFT, uh, it has uh, this liver function test. It has total uh, bilirubin values are 0.2 to 0.8 milligram per deciliter. Then conjugated bilirubin values are 0 to 0.2. Total protein, these are for the normal uh, level, 6 to 8. Albumin to be 3.5 to 5. And the coagulation factors from 11 to 12 seconds. So enzymes includes your uh, SGPT uh, marker enzyme for liver diseases that is SGPTs yeah ALT and there is also SGOTs uh, that is ASTs and alkaline phosphatases ALP gamma glutamyl transferase DGTs and 5 nucleotidase. So these are the enzymes that are present in our, our liver and for the same we are having special test called bile acid level test blood ammonia alpha 1 antitrypsin alpha 1 phytoprotein, hepatitis markers, immunoglobins, uh, seroproplasmin and ferritin. So these are the special tests we go for. So in total serum bilirubin the value is uh, 0 0.2 0 0.8 whereas a conjugated one it's less than 0 0.2 and the unconjugated value is 0 0.2 to 0 0.6 milligram per deciliter. So we have to do these tests this is called Van den Berg reactions. So in this normal serum uh, gives a negative Van der Berg reaction. So what is the principle behind them? So the reagent that we are using, it's a mixture of equal volume of sulfonylic acid in dilute HCl and sodium nitrate. So that diotized uh, sulfonylic acid, the above mixture that we have shown, reacts with bilirubin to form a purple colored azobilirubin. Yeah, purple colored azobilirubin. So direct positive test is Conjugated bilirubin gives a purple color immediately on addition of the reagent. Where the indirect positive purple color develops only when the reagents and methanol are added. So unconjugated bilirubin gives colors only when methanol is added to that. Then there is a biphasic uh, in which purple color develops an addition of reagents. Addition of methanol defines the color. And elevation of both un un unconjugated and conjugated bilirubin could be identified. So there is indirect positive that is hemolytic jaundice. If it is direct positive then obstructive jaundice. If it is biphasic then it is a hepatic jaundice. So about bilirubin in urine. Normally bilirubin is absent in urine. But conjugated bilirubin being water soluble could be excreted via urine in the obstructive jaundice. So this could be detected by the Fauch test in which urine urobilinogen, so normally traced uh, amounts in the present. So in obstructive jaundice, no urobilinogen is present in the urine. So if it is absent, that means uh, there is a chance of obstructive jaundice. So because bilirubin cannot enter intestine, uh, as we know, the presence of bilirubin in urine and absence of uro 
bilirubin in urine is seen in obstructive jaundice so in hemolytic jaundice increased production of bilirubin causes increased formation of urobilinogen which appears in the urine so that means increased urobilinogen in urine absence of bilirubin in urine is seen in the hemolytic jaundice then there is a fecal uh, urobilinogen that is its amount is around 300 mg is present if it is increased in hemolytic jaundice in which colored feces become very dark and in the obstructive jaundice urobilinogen is not excreted through the feces and the color faces are color is pale in that case then there is serum albumin so they are about present 10 to 12 uh, gram of albumin is synthesized in the liver daily so its estimation is very valuable in assessing the chronic liver diseases so low serum albumin level is commonly observed in the sever a uh, severe, uh, severe uh, liver diseases S severe and prothrombin uh, which normally stands for 11 to 12 seconds so prothrombin time is a prolonged in severe parenchymal liver diseases due to decreased synthesis of prothrombin so vitamin K is required for the synthesis of prothrombin and vitamin K deficiency can also lead to prolonged PT so if PT returns to normal after the vitamin K injection, it indicates that hepatocyte function is good. So plasma protein of diagnostic values in liver diseases. So you have protein uh, like albumin, lambda albumin, alpha antitrypsin. Carolupoplasmin transferrin. So the condition that is required uh, that they are doing is chronic liver diseases, cirrhosis, especially autoimmune, and cirrhosis due to alpha 1 trypsin deficiency, then Wilson diseases, primary hepatocellular carcinoma, and hemochromatosis. So, these uh, are changes in concentration, it's become low in albumin, high in this lambda globulin, and this they are low in the alpha trips, antitrypsin, and lower in the seroplasmin and great in the highly in the phytoproteins then there is a trans aminases like ALT like we have discussed SGPT and SGOTs their values are mostly near to the 3 to 15 uh, unit so ALT is primarily localized to the liver it is a marker enzyme of the liver and ALT is present in the cytosol of the hepatocytes and AST is present in the wide variety of tissues like heart, liver, skeletal muscles, kidney, brain. So AST is present both in cytosol and mitochondria of the hepatocytes. And liver contains both enzymes but more of the ALT. So estimation says that it's usually in assessing the severity and prognosis of liver uh, parenchymal diseases, especially infected hepatitis. Yeah. Then elevated ALT and AST, so if they are elevated, uh, they are like 20 times the normal value, then it's a viral hepatitis. So drug or toxins are induced uh, in the hepatic necrosis. So moderately, they could be uh, elevated from 3 to 20 times, and it is a chronic hepatitis. So alcoholic hepatitis, autoimmune hepatitis, acute biliary tract obstructions are possible. 
Then there's alkaline phosphatase that is ALP, which values normally ranges from 3 to 13. Uh, this is a family of zinc metalloenzymes which with a serine at the active center and they release inorganic phosphate from various organic phosphatases. So in the liver it is found in microvilli of the bile caniculi and on the sinusoidal surface of the hepatocytes. So the important sources of ALP is bone and ALP is highly elevated in obstructive jaundice and bone diseases like rickets. Then there is a lambda glutamyl transpetidase. Uh, which normal value is around 10 to 15 unit per liter and its membrane bound glycoprotein which catalyzes the transfer of lambda glutamyl group to other peptidases and AAS. So very useful in diagnosis of obstructive jaundice and it is a microsomal enzyme and serum GGT is highly elevated in obstructive jaundice and alcoholic liver diseases and this enzyme is an inducible enzyme. Then further 5 prime nucleotase, this normal value is from 2 to 15 unit per liter and it is elevated in the obstructive jaundice. Advantage of this enzyme is that it is not elevated in the bone diseases. Then test for assessing detoxification function of liver, there is a hypopuric acid test in this. Uh, the main principle is that it is produced in the liver when benzoic acid combined with the glycine. And the, for the procedure, we have 6 gram of sodium benzoate which is given to the patient and urine is collected up to 4 hours. And hypopuric acid excreted in urine is estimated and 6 gram of sodium benzoate forms 7.5 gram of hypopuric acid. Then 60% of sodium benzoate that is 4.0 gram of hypopuric acid is excreted in normally and decreased hypopuric acid excretion leads to the decrease in the 3 gram indicates hepatic damage. So bilirubin normally um, or in mild they increases so total protein are normal albumin may decrease in them albumin increase ALP is highly elevated so retention time would be 45 minutes. In the alcoholic hepatitis, uh, bilirubin will be mild elevation, ALP will be elevated, ALT will be mild elevated and GGT will be highly elevated. So this is the summary of what we have just discussed. Bilirubin, amino transferases, alkaline phosphatases, albumin, uh, gamma globins and prothrombin. So what happen in various diseases such as acute hepatitis, chronic hepatitis, cirrhosis, cholestasis, Malignancies, malignancy and infiltrations. So how their value ranges. So N is the normal. If there is a single arrow that means it's moderately elevated, double, intermediate. If three arrows then highly. Yeah. So this was the something about LFTs. But parenchymal diseases, so they are the one, they are the renal parenchymal diseases actually, also termed as medical renal diseases, which includes various disorders of glomerulus interstitium tubules and small blood vessels of the kidneys. So the clinical spectrum encompasses diseases confined to the kidneys and systemic disorders that secondarily affect the kidney. Yeah. Now let's talk about jaundice. So in this we will discuss about uh, jaundice. What is jaundice is we will understand its classification and evolution of jaundice and to study various approaches to treatment of it. So mainly jaundice term was identified by the French 
John Johnny means yellow. So it's a yellowish discoloration of tissue resulting from the deposition of bilirubin. So tissue deposition of bilirubin occurs only in the presence of serum hyperbilirubinemia, which is a sign of either liver disease or hemolytic disease. So keratinema and the use of drug quinacine are few other causes of yellow coloration of tissue. So keratinemia can be distinguished from jaundice by sparing of sclera. So in 4 to 37 percent patients treated with conicrine yellowish discoloration of skin is seen. So unlike keratinemia, uh, quinacine uh, can cause discoloration of sclera. So introduction. So under steady state normal metabolic conditions, about 3.9 milligram per kilogram. Uh, or 250 to 350 milligram of bilirubin is produced each day from breakdown of heme from RBC in spleen and liver. So one gram of hemoglobin yields 36.2 milligram of bilirubin. So this is the summary of our bilirubin, how everything is produced uh, in our body. So this one, this whole big diagram here is the macrophage in which is present in spleen liver or red bone marrow this is our liver and these are our red bone marrow yeah this is kidney and yeah so let's start first step this is the rbc's rbd uh, red blood cells uh, death and phagocytosis is happening so the second step will be that we will get the heme out of them and this heme will go make globin and from the globin amino acids will produce so they could go uh, these amino acids to make uh, ferric yeah with the help of transferrin enzyme they make ferritin and this ferritin uh, will be used with the help of fp3 plus ferric ions with the help of again transferrin enzyme will move towards the bone marrow and there again with the fp3 plus and globin and vitamin b12 erythropoietin erythropoiesis will happen and it will again make a new RBC here and will go again circulation for about 120 days. So in this way your cycle will keep moving again and again. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 then 8 and this red arrow is showing everything is happening in the blood. Everything is happening in the blood. Then uh, afterwards, your heme could also produce bilirubin, and from that bilirubin will be produced. So from this bilirubin, uh, they will go into the small intestine, and then from a small intestine, they go make to the urobilinogen, and with the help of bacteria, they go into the kidney to production of urobilin, and hence you have urine production. Then stericobilin and feces at later. So this go further for the large intestine. And the green ones that we show here, this is happening in the bile. Yeah. So that's the summary how your bilirubin is moving around within the liver, macrophages, bone marrow and kidney. So this is a Van Derg Vandenberg test. It is helpful in determining the type of bilirubin present in the serum. So normal serum gives a negative Van der Berg test. So it is performed using diazo reagent. We have discussed in the previous slide about LFTs. So mixture of sulfonylic acids and hydrochloric acids and sodium nitrate. So when diazo reagent is added to the serum containing conjugated bilirubin, a purple coloration is obtained within the 30 seconds. And this is called direct positive Van der Berg reaction. Okay. Then etiological classifications of jaundice. So it could be first is hemolytic, which is an intracorpuscular defects, which will have hereditary spherocytosis, spherocytosis, and hemoglobinopathies like sickle cell anemia, beta thalassemia, and extracorpuscular defects in which the infection will happen like malaria. So drug is required is quinine. 
and burns poison snake venom uh, mismatched blood transfusion so all these regions could be there then there is a hepatocellular that is hepatic jaundice in this infection is viral hepatitis malaria typhoid or septicemia and is quite toxic so anesthetic agents like halothane chloroform or anti tubercle drugs like rifamycin isonized uh, ps are used and metal sign like arsenic mercury gold yeah and this cirrhosis which could be portal and biliary then third one is your obstructive jaundice this is post hepatic in which we can see some stones stricture parasites uh, head of pancreas congenital biliary atresia so in the congenital and the congenital hyperbilirubinemia so unconjugated such as disturbance of bilirubin transport like gilbert syndrome or disturbance of bilirubin conjugation like kriegler nager syndrome yeah in the conjugated one there will be disturbance in the excretion of bilirubin like dubin johnson syndrome rota syndrome so this is showing a very nice summary of all the three types of jaundice that is hemolytic jaundice hepatic jaundice and obstructive jaundice that is your post hepatic jaundice so what is the mechanism of production so in the first case excessive breakdown of rbcs are are happening we need to the production of unconjugated bilirubin in the amounts more than the healthy liver can conjugate and excrete in the hepatic jaundice inability of liver to efficiently conjugate and transport bilirubin into the bile due to the liver cell damage then obstructive jaundice this obstruction of bile ducts so conjugated bilirubin can't flow through the biliary tract freely resulting in the increased serum conjugated bilirubin then there are type of serum bilirubin accumulated like unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia then both unconjugated and conjugated bilirubin is increased in the serum and in the other case is a conjugated hyperbilirubinemia in the van dug uh, berg test we see a uh, indirect positive reaction then biphasic in the second and direct positive reaction in the third so in the urine bilirubin uh, is absent in a hemolytic uh, present in the hepatic also present in the obstructive and the urine urobilinogen they are increased in the first part they decrease in the second and in the third they are markedly decreased or absent so there is a fecal stericobilinogen which is markedly increase in the first and reduce in the hepatic jaundice and obstructive jaundice uh, is absent in the third so fecal fat level so they are normal in hepatic they are increased and obstructive also increased and peripheral blood film they are anemia uh, reticulocytosis in the hemolytic normal in hepatic and obstructive jaundice it's also normal then plasma albumin globin and your as to g ratio it will be normal in the first and the third case but in the second case albumin is decreased due to less synthesis by damaged and globulin increased uh, ratio decreases in the second case serum alkaline phosphatase normal because excreted in bile in the second case is increased because lex excretion in bile in the third markedly increased because not excreted in the in that case so liver function test lft normal as liver is healthy in the second case is impaired and the third case is also normal mildly impaired some clinical characteristics uh spleen um is present may be present absent gall bladder not palpable a uh, not palpable may be palpable urine color normal deep yellow deep yellow stool color dark brown pale faces and clay colored stool so that was very nice summary between the three types of jaundices now let's go uh, breast milk jaundice in this few babies ex exclusive breast feed develop jaundice in the second week of life and may continue till the third month it is presumed due to the inhibitory substance in the breast milk that interfere with the bilirubin conjugation like uh, pranogadiol or free fatty acids so bilirubin level of over 20 mg per deciliter may be attained 
and temporary interruption of breast milk feed reduces the serum levels of bilirubin. So pathological jaundice in newborns appears within the 24 hours of age and increases of bilirubin with more than 5 mg per deciliter per 24 hours. And total serum bilirubin will be more than 15 mg per deciliter and direct bilirubin is more than 2 mg per deciliter. Then hemolytic jaundice in newborn. This condition results from incompatibility between maternal and fetal blood groups. So rhesus positive fetus may produce antibodies in rhesus negative mother. And rhesus incompatibility first child often escapes and subsequent child would be affected. So sometimes the child is born with severe hemolytic disease often referred to as erythroblastosis fetalis. So when blood level is more than 20 mg per deciliter, the capacity of albumin to bind bilirubin is exceeded. So outcome is that we learn about jaundice, students will understand the classification of jaundice and they will understand the views of various approaches to the evolution and the treatment. So these are the references. Thank you very much. So this was about jaundice. So students here we take a 5 minutes break, Yeah, we meet at around 1650 and then we continue with the next part of disease that is hypothyroidism. This is the next in series, so let's take a break here and then we go for this third lecture.
So hyperthyroidism. Um, in this, we will understand about hypothyroidism. What are the causes of hypothyroidism, and how we can treat this? So, in this introductory part, so thyroid gland actually regulates metabolic function of the body, virtually in every cell. So, everything from brain to skin is affected by the hormones made by the thyroid gland. So, the hypo there is hyper and a hypo. Hypo means less. Hyper means more. And in hypothyroidism, it slows you down, it makes you lethargic and fatigue and your hair becomes brittle, your skin becomes dry and you become cold much easier than the average person. So in condition where there is a reduced production of thyroid hormone, so it's characterized by as a primary and secondary based upon its causes, basis of its cause. So primary is occurring due to the improper functioning of the thyroid gland, may be further classified as overt and subclinical hypothyroidism so which affects approximately 5% of the individuals with elderly women being most commonly affected and secondary hypothyroidism it occurs due to the inadequate stimulation of thyroid glands by thyroid stimulating hormones TSH so maybe due to the congenital or acquired defects in the pituitary or hypothalamus and it's quite rare and occurs in less than 1% of the individuals and there is a primary hypothyroidism uh, in this the etiology says that in the thyroid dysfunction so autoimmune thyroiditis your Hashimoto thyroiditis so it's a congenital absence or defect in the thyroid tissue and thyroid removal is, is done in the surgery in order to uh, make it like diagnose it or radioablation of radioactive iodine or irritation is done or destruction of thyroid tissues caused by the infiltrative disorders such as amyloidosis, sarcoidosis. So impaired synthesis of thyroid hormone. So iodine deficiency, most common cause is uh, congen congen congenital enzymatic defects and drug mediated includes thionamides, amidodarone, lithium, amino, glutathamidine and carbamazole. Carbamazole. Then secondary hypothyroidism, uh, it includes Reduce secretion of your TRH, thyroid stimulating hormone. So hypothalamic disorders, so like tumor, infiltrative disorders. And hypopituitarism is also possible with the marsh lesions, pituitary surgery, uh, pituitary radiations, uh, lymphatic hypophysitis. Then clinical manifestation has to be done in this. The symptoms are tired, dry skin, cold sensation, growth is retarded poor concentration, constipation, dyspnea, uh, impairment of carpal tunnel syndrome and so on. So clinical manifestation, the signs are there are cold peripheral extremities, puffiness of the face, edema, hoard lace and brittle nails, hypertension, slow relaxation of tendon reflex and cavity effusions. Then hypothyroidism in children, they are delayed growth in the children and delayed appearance of the permanent teeth. And this is a delayed or precocious puberty and pseudo hypertrophy of muscles is possible. And then laboratory diagnosis. So TSH assay, primary test is established to diagnosis. And additional tests like estimation of free uh, T3 and T4. So test for thyroid and autoantibodies, thyroid scan and serum cholesterol in hypothyroidism. And overt hypothyroidism in which your T3 and T4 is reduced and your TSH is increased. And a subclinical hypothyroidism, your T3 and T4 remain same and TSH is increased in that. So treatment. Uh, is that that you mimic the normal physical physiological levels of elevated signs, symptoms and biomedical uh, abnormalities. So treatment should be tailored to the individual one. So treatment of choice is levothyroxine that is LT4 replacement therapy or desiccated thyroid hormones like T3 and T4 mixture. Uh, insufficient evidence that not recommended for replacement therapy by 
ASE guidelines. So the thyroid function is also done during the pregnancy. That is your FT3, FT4 and TSH. So there are three trimesters during that part. Uh, the normal values in the pregnancies are 3.7 to 7.2, 12 to 23 and 0.27 to 4.2 for FT3, FT4 and TSH respectively. And during these three tri uh, prim trimesters, these values ranges from as, as written there. So if the values are going up and down, then something is problem with the thyroid, it's need to be checked. Then there's a congenital hypothyroidism, uh, which happen in the children. So in infants, hypothermia, poor feeding, uh, bradycardia, jaundice, enlarged posterior uh, fontanel, and umbilical hernia. So children and adolescents includes your growth failure, markedly delayed bone maturation, delayed eruption of permanent teeth, in jaundice is muscle, pseudohypertrophy, uh, in umbilical hernia, pituitary enlargement and so on. So what are the morbid uh, conditions of hypothyroidism that it could lead to the infertility, depression, hyperlidemia uh, and autoimmune disorders. So we have understood about hypothyroidism, we have understood about the cause of hypothyroidism and various approaches to its treatment now. So that's it from the hypothyroidism perspective. So this was the clinical aspect of uh, medicinal biochemistry that how it is important, how it is done. So we are done with this part also. Now remaining uh, lecture for the next one hour will be about enzymes. Okay, so we will now take the chapter of enzymes now. First we discuss the history. So enzyme engineering, uh, it includes history of enzyme engineering that is uh, background, history, background and fundamentals of protein chemistry. So this enzyme are actually, they are the proteins that catalyze our chemical reactions by lowering the activation energy and fastening the chemical reaction. So enzyme engineering is actually the modifying enzyme structure, modifying the catalytic of the isolated enzymes. So if we see the from the BC point before cryos. So enzymes were used in the bread, beer, uh, using yeast to make food and also production of cheese and wine was also done. Then first in the history, if we see the first vaccination was done by Edward Jenner, who was an English scientist who invented smallpox vaccine, also known as father of immunology. Then comes Mendelian inheritance, who was the father of genetics, who is known for work on the peace uh, over the genetics work. 
Um, then later on, first alcoholic respiration was discovered by cell-free extract by the German chemist who got a Nobel Prize winner in 1907. Then lock and key model was discovered by Hermann uh, Emil Fischer from 1877 to 1947, got the Nobel Prize in 1902 for his work. Then discovery of antibiotics by Alexander Fleming. Uh, who is a Scottish biologist who got the Nobel Prize in the 1945. Then the determination of insulin, this Frederick Sanger who got twice Nobel Prize winner, one for the uh, ins insulin, yeah, sequence determination of insulin, then further the nucleotides discovery. Then proposed DNA structure was James D. Watson and Francis Crick uh, who have dis uh, got the Nobel Prize together in 1962 for the structure of DNA. Then recombinant DNA technology for the genetic engineering techniques by the American great gen uh, genetists Cohen and Bohr. Then side directed mutagenesis by Michael Smith, British born Canadian biochemist, uh, established side directed mutagenesis and winner of 1993 Nobel Prize winner in chemistry. Then PCR, it was discovered by Kerry B. Mullis. This is an American biochemist, developed polymer chain reactions and winner of 1993 Nobel Prize in the Chemistry. So in the pros prospect of enzyme, so in 1893 first catalyst was defined by the Oswald, then lock and key model was proposed by Fisher, then Buchner demonstrated that enzyme do not require a cell, then Sumner proved that enzyme is a protein, then Koshland he said that induced fit model was proposed and then uh, first amino acid of ribonuclease was proposed in 1963. Then allosteric model came by Monod. Then 1970 immobilized enzymes came. Uh, then 1980 protein engineering chiral compounds enzymes in the organic solvents. And 1990 directed evolution. And in 2000 computational design of enzymes started. So as we have discussed, these are the various scientists who got Nobel Prize winner in the field of enzyme engineering. Buchner, Oswald, Fisher, Sumner, Sanger and Tuppy, Murenstein, Smith, Mullis. Yeah. So they worked, uh, their prospective works is that the first alcoholic respiration with cell free extract and William Oswald, uh, they defined the term catalyst. Then Emil Fisher found the lock and key concept and James B. Sumner, the first en enzyme was crystallized urease from the jack beans. Then Frederick Sanger and Hans Tuppy, sequence determination of insulin beta chain and Stanford, Murray and William Stein amino acid sequence of lysosomes and ribonuclease elucidated. Then Michael Smith, site directed mutagenesis to change enzyme sequence. Then Carrie B. Mullis, uh, he invented the PCR. Then enzyme technology versus chemical technology. So the advantages are that one of the enzyme technology is that it's high degree of selectivity, environmental friendly, um, no toxic products are producing non-toxic, non-flammable and catalyzed broad reaction of uh, reactions. Uh, where the disadvantages it's a bit expensive, bit unstable and productivity is also a bit low. Then nomenclature, this we will discuss. Yeah. So there are six types of uh, enzymes that is oxyreductase, transferases, hydrolases, lysases, isomerases, ligases. So oxyreductase is the, the one which catalyzes the oxyreduction reaction, oxidation reduction reaction. Transferases are the which transfer the functional group. Hydrolases are the catalyze the hydrolysis of the various bonds. Then lysis cleaves various bonds by mean other than hydrolysis and oxidation. Then isomerases, they catalyze isomerization changes with single molecule. Then ligases, they join two molecules with the covalent bond. Some industrial enzymes and their production, some examples of the same, some enzymatic reactions. So if we see um, these are the hydrolases are produced uh, in the industrial biocatalysis. So this is shown from the USA, a new plant in Geismar, which has a capacity of production of 2500 uh, trillion per acre. So it could produce this much of amount of hydrolases. So we see the carbohydrates are the largest production in the enzyme case and the fat derivatives, steroids, peptidase, nucleotides, other chiral and non chiral compounds. So the product market that includes is pharma is the highest 
which are using the enzymes then comes your food then comes your agro then your cosmetics then your polymers then your feed and then other several sectors then further uh, within these enzymes hydrolysis has the highest percentage then comes your transferases then oxidizing cells and reducing cells around 28 percent then lysases then isomerases then oxyreductases then this is your chemoautotrophic and photoautotrophic yeah chemoautotrophic and photoautotrophic So chemoautotrophic includes your uh, this cell on which carbon dioxide is added, yeah, and hydrogens are also added, and then your ATP uh, is produced inside your cell. And the photoautotrophic it needs a light from the outside, and then carbon dioxide also, and then this is a photoautotrophic. Then kind of vectors uh, reactors. That are used during the production of enzymes. The highest are the batch reactor, then fed batch reactors, then continuous plug flow, uh, continuous tear tanks. This you might have understood in the bioreactors and the unknown factors. And then there's a free cell, immobilized cells, free enzymes, immobilized enzymes that are highly used in the industry. So enzyme activity dependent upon the phosphorylation, expression level, inhibition, glycosylation, st uh, stability, molecular dynamics, mechanism of kinetics. It depends upon the pH, temperature, how is the um, enzyme is present, enzyme concentration, substrate concentration. So many factors it depends upon. So this is, so basically your, as we have discussed, your enzymes depend upon the amino acids so these amino acids further depend upon the alkyl group so these alkyl groups could be non-polar aliphatic uh, compound like glycine alanine valine leucine methanine isoleucine and they could be polar and uncharged like serine threonine and so on and there's positively charged ions and aromatic R group this we have discussed in the amino acids groups so depending upon them your enzyme will work so that was the uh, basics or history uh, of enzyme engineering, how enzyme engineering works, uh, what is its history was all about, and why is it important, and how it, it is uh, essential in our day-to-day -day life. Now we have discussed the history, now it's time for to understand the mechanism behind it. So by the end of lecture, so in this part you will understand, I able to define enzyme related terms like active site, apoenzyme, holoenzyme, prosthetic group, enzyme specificity, explain the energy of activation, describe the structure of enzyme, uh, what are the known mechanism of actions are present and we will further to understand the classification of enzymes. So first thing first, the importance. So as we have discussed that it's very important these enzymes in metabolism and diagnosis and therapeutics. And as we have discussed this bilirubin, all the three diseases that we have discussed. Uh, so in that case, your enzymes were very important also. So their level, how much they are present and they could be good indicator for various my my myocardial infections. And they are therapeutically uh, used as a digestive enzyme also. So enzymes are acting as a biological catalyst. So they are proteins that increase the rate of reactions by lowering the energy of activation. So they catalyze nearly all the chemical reactions taking place in the cells of the body. Not altered or consumed during the reaction and they could be re 
usable also. So important terms to understand biochemical nature and activity of enzymes. So the area on the enzyme where the substrate or substrates attached to it is called as active site. And they are very usually very enzymes are usually very large proteins, but the active site is very small region of the enzyme molecules. So active sites uh, enzyme molecules contain a special pocket or cleft called active site. It has a substrate and active site. The enzyme will come attached to it, will make enzyme substrate complex, then enzyme product complex will form. And afterwards, your product will be removed and leaving the enzyme active site empty. And this enzyme could be reused million times. And this reaction keep going on. Another substrate will come and it will attach. So there are two models uh, in this. Uh, it is lock and key model and induced fit hypothesis. So this is the earlier one by Emil Fisher it was discovered. And they say that uh, in the lock key model, the active side is, has very rigid shape. And only substrate with the matching shape can fit into it. And the substrate is a key that fits the lock of the active site. So this is the substrate uh, attached to the enzyme and is correctly fit with will react and in cut, cut correct substrate and no reaction will happen. And this explains enzyme specificity and this explains the loss of activity when enzymes denatures. Then apoenzyme and holoenzyme. The enzyme without its non-protein moiety is termed as apoenzyme and it is inactive. And holoenzyme is an active enzyme with its non-protein component. So you have apoenzyme uh, which is a protein portion which is inactive. And this is your cofactor which acts as a coenzyme non-protein portion which is an activator. Yeah. And the holoenzyme your coenzyme will attach and only then it is active enzyme and then substrate could be attached to it. Right. Then cofactor, a cofactor is a non-protein chemical compound that is bound to an enzyme and is required for the catalysis. So there are types of cofactors that is coenzymes and prosthetic groups. So there are types of cofactors, they could be coenzymes and prosthetic groups. Coenzymes are the non-protein components loosely bound to the apoenzyme by non-covalent bond. So they are vitamins or compound derived from vitamins. And prosthetic group, there is a non-protein component tightly bound to the apoenzyme by covalent bond is called as prosthetic group. So enzymes are very specific according to the substrates, could be recognized and catalyzed a single substrate or group of similar substrate or a particular type of bond. So if it is a particular uh, single substrate, they could be absolute. If it is a uh, group of catalyzed a similar substrate, group of them, is a group substrate and then if it is a uh, about specific type of bond then it's a linkage type so examples for them respectively are urease catalyzes only the hydrolysis of urea hexokinase adds a phosphate group to hexoses and chymotrypsin catalyzes the hydrolysis of the peptide bond and further the uh, in the term of activation energy uh, all chemical reaction requires some amount of energy to get them started it is the first push that they need required and that energy is called as activation energy. So in order, in order to understand what we have done so far, let's see a summary of that, that enzymes are producing a complex or hollow enzymes and, and also there is a simple only protein. So the hollow enzymes, um, they, they have two things. One is apoenzyme and cofactor. Apoenzyme the protein part and there is a cofactor. And the cofactor has two parts that is prosthetic group and coenzyme. And the prosthetic group usually small inorganic molecule or atom and usually tightly bound to the apoenzyme. And the coenzyme is a larger organic molecule loosely bound to the apoenzyme. So mechanism of action of enzymes. So enzymes increases reaction rate by decreasing the activation energy. And enzyme substrate interaction includes a lock and key model and induced fit model. So we can see here uh, without the enzyme, uh, there's a guy who has in this boulder and wanted to take to the high peak and will then release it. So this is the energy that that energy that he's putting up on till making the top. This is the activation energy without the enzyme. But once it goes down, uh, the net energy will be released from the splitting of the 
your enzyme, your uh, product. So let's say if you have lactose and it's got broke down into glucose and galactose. And in this reaction, there's a lo lots of activation energy is required. Yeah, but if in the same case, if your enzyme is present, that is lactase. So this reaction will not require any, any, any activation energy that it was required in the previous one. And you will get your energy uh, released very less. Same, uh, there's H2O2, this hydrogen peroxide, which gives H2O and O2. Uh, in the same case, the energy release would be, if you want to break that bond, it will be 86 kilojoule per ml. But once you add a uh, catalase enzyme into that, the, rec the energy required would be 1 kilojoule per mole. So 85 kilojoule per mole will be decreased just in the presence of your enzyme. So the same thing has been discovered. In the absence of enzyme, very high energy required. In the, absence, in the presence of enzyme, uh, it's become decreased. So this is uh, activation energy without enzyme and this is with, uh, with is lower. So delta G is unaffected by the enzymes here. So lock and key model. So in the lock and key model of enzyme action, the active site has a rigid shape and only substrate with matching shape can fit. A substrate is a key that fits the lock of the active site. And this is an older model, however, does not work for all enzymes. And in the induced fit model, you have this active site, substrate attaching to it. So in the induced fit model of enzyme action, the active site is flexible, not rigid. And the shape of enzyme active site and substrate adjust to the maximum size that improves the catalysis. So in the lock and key model, we can see it has a rigid shape an enzyme can only fit but this was not uh, accepted by most of the people so that's why this uh, model came which says enzyme is flexible active site is flexible and any shape could be attached to it yeah in order to improve the catalysis and this was accepted by the great range of substrate and this is the more consistent with wider range of enzymes so that's it from the uh, mechanism of enzyme action how various enzymes are working in nutshell Students, uh, please uh, do recommend on the um, on the on the Google. Give your honest views on the Google review. Uh, what do you think about Edu Fabrica workshop within these small days? Did you like it or not? Did you enjoy the course content that you were given to you? Uh, within these three days of workshop uh, just give your honest feedback on the Google review it will be very nice yeah try to give positive if possible it will be good for me also and for our company so we have discussed a lot of things during these days from your nucleic acids structure of DNA, yeah, uh, PCR, we have discussed DNA isolation, uh, transcription, translation, genetic code, genome co coding, uh, introduction to biochemistry, amino acids, classification of amino acids, lipids, nucleotides, yeah, uh, then blotting techniques, uh, your gel electrophoresis, virtual lab of it. And now today we have discussed about medicinal biochemistry concepts like LFT, jaundice hypothyroidism now we are discussing about the enzymes a little bit history a little bit about the mechanism now we will go a little bit about more uh, like allosterism and uh, classification of it and how uh, things are working so it's 1920 let's take a five minutes break here and then we start with the another yet another lecture for
classification and kinetics of enzymes.
so let's start student great great thank you so much Thank you, Akshay. What about other students? Please do. Because we don't want anything fake to be here. We want, if we are working hard, then we also get things good for. Uh, our company also get good grades for that uh, nothing more than that so nomenclature of enzyme so in this we will acquaint with the nomenclature and classification of enzymes to understand the specificity of enzyme and they know the basic concept of allosteric regulations understanding the feedback mechanism So here we can see the active site substrate loves it it's go and there's a bonding happening so let's start so these are the six enzymes as we have discussed it this different types of categories that is oxyreductase transferase hydrolase lyase isomerase and lycase so oxyreductase as we know they do the reactions to check the redox reactions that is reductase and uh, oxidases so they have lactate with NAD plus and pyruvate with NADH so there is a lactate dehydrogenase and yeah, these reactions and transferases, uh, they are the transfer group from one molecule to another, like transminases, which catalyze transfer of amino group, and kinases, which transfer of phosphate group. So here, methyl group donor is attached. This is norepinephrine, and the presence of PNMT enzyme, this methyl group get attached to the norepinephrine. It's become a epinephrine. <coughs> then hydrolysis, which cleave bonds by adding water like phosphatases, peptidases and lipases. So you have a triglyceride here, CH2, CH, CH2 uh, with three bonds here plus 3H2 and in the presence of lipase uh, it will make glycerol and fatty acid. On other hand, uh, another hand lysases which catalyze the removal of groups to form double bonds or the reverse break double bonds. So decarboxylases and synthesis. So there is a fumarate in the presence of fumarase um, which is having this double bond here will be broken having this OH bond and H bond and that is malate. Then there is a isomerases which catalyze intramolecular rearrangements like epimerases and mutases. Um, so you will have three phosphoglycerate uh, on the second carbon atom phosphate group will be attached and there is a phosphoglycerate mutase on the first on the second carbon it goes from third to second uh, your phosphate group is changed so this is a changing of the your group then there is a ligases which catalyze a reaction in which C, CS so two uh, different DNA strands could be attached in the presence of DNA ligase. So with OH and phosphate group, they got attached and two DNA strands are attached in that. Then there is a nomenclature of enzyme. So in this, uh, in the end, we add ACE whenever this enzyme is. So like for case of urea, so we remove A, then you will have urease. And if you remove from the O's, lactose, 
pose and then you add as it's a lactase so there is also some another enzyme according to the functions like lactate dehydrogenase pyruvate decarboxylase right and some enzymes are given them which doesn't have any historical values like catalase pepsin chymotrypsin and trypsin then effect of enzyme on the activation energy of the reaction so there is a k equivalent giving rise uh, a the stoichiometric a with capital a as a substrate and product as a capital b stoichiometric small b so the equilibrium constant will be product by reactant product will be raised to power b and reactant will be raised to power small a so enzyme speeds a reaction by lowering the activation energy changing the reaction pathway and this provides a lower energy route for the conversion of the substrate to product and every chemical reaction is characterized by an equilibrium constant which is a reflection of difference in the energy between reactant and products so diagram of energy uh, difference reactants and products so you have a energy diagram here reactant a plus b and product c plus d so during the progress of reaction you, in the uncatalyzed reaction you have lot of high activation energy required in the case of catalyzed reaction it's become very low very very low so an uncatalyzed reaction acti large activation energy is required as we can see in the left and in the right we can see lower significantly your activation energy and the rate of reaction so the effect of substrate concentration on enzyme catalyzed reactions so you have a uncatalyzed reaction and enzyme catalyzed reaction so non catalyzed reaction if the substrate concentration is increasing your rate of reaction uh, is also increasing so they are like linear towards each other but in other case it will be hyperbolic that is at one point it will reach to saturation point it will not increase much and that value will be the vmax so rate of uncatalyzed reactions increases as the substrate concentration increases and rate of enzyme catalyst shows two stage first enzyme substrate complex is made uh, here and then slow conversion of product is done and this is rate of fraction is limited by the enzyme how much enzyme is present so then enzyme substrate complex so e plus s makes es then then enzyme transition state then enzyme product complex then enzyme plus product so this is the transition state this is the complex and this is the product complex so these all four steps are there so during these steps um, your reacticide plays a big role uh, which is having a pocket or cleft in the surface of the enzyme your shape of active site is complementary to the shape of substrate and enzyme attracts and holds the enzyme using weak non covalent interaction and conformation of the active site determines the specificity of the enzyme also so this is the lock and key enzyme model your enzyme is there this is your substrate and enzyme substrate complex is made so in the lock and key model the enzyme is assumed to be the lock and substrate the key so enzyme and substrates are made, made to fit exactly and this model fails to take into account protein conformational changes to accommodate a substrate molecule so induced fit enzyme model this is a uh, action assume that enzyme activity is more flexible pocket whose conformation changes to accommodate the substrate molecule so enzyme your substrate is coming up there attaching to the enzyme and it's making a enzyme substrate complex so that's it so there is a possible types of transition states so for example here glucose is attaching to the another fructose and in this case while doing so uh, in the presence of enzyme uh, they both make a sucrose bond and the water is released out of it so here we can see there is an enzyme substrate complex is there uh, and to which your transition state enzyme substrate come and they get joined together water is removed and at then you have a new product as a joint together so that's how the enzyme works in this case of thing so there are also cofactors and coenzymes so that they are apoenzymes plus substrate yeah so no enzyme substrate complex then no reaction so if 
there is no cofactor is present then no reaction will happen but if a cofactor is present like a copper so it will attach to it your substrate will attach and reaction will occur and you will have your product afterwards so in the active enzyme is your holo enzyme and the polypeptide portion of enzyme are apoenzyme and non-protein prosthetic group that is cofactor and the cofactor are bound to the enzyme for its maintained correct configuration of active site that is metal lines, organic compounds, organometallic compounds. Then comes your coenzymes. The coenzymes is required by some enzymes. So an organic molecule is bound to the enzyme by weak interaction, that is hydrogen bonds. And most coenzymes carry electrons or small groups. And many have modified vitamins in their structure. Right. So here we can see a uh, coenzyme is there. You have substrate one and two, and the functional group is attached to the substrate one. Yeah. So it what it will do this enzyme, it will give this functional group to substrate two uh, with the help of cofactor, and then you have two products, product one and product two. Whereas the product two will have this functional enzyme then. So this is all the various examples of vitamins. Vitamin. Um, thiamine, riboflobin, niacin, pyridoxine uh, with the various uh, coenzymes and their respective functions. Then allosteric enzymes, they are the affected molecules change the activity of an enzyme by binding at a act second site. So some effectors speed up enzyme action uh, that is positive allosterism and some effectors sh uh, slow down the enzymatic reaction that is negative allosterism. So here we can see substrate they are attached to it to the enzyme and there is a factor binding site yeah so you have two products and they are negative feedback uh, factors they have so once they are done the one of the negative feedback factor it will attach to the factor binding site and it will shut down the active site and no further reaction could happen so it's act as a negative feedback inhibitor so same way, one example is here, this, this phosphate group is there. We have added ATP in this fructose 6-phosphate. And then the presence of enzyme phosphofructokinase, another phosphate group is attached. And then ADP is produced. So a third reaction of glycolysis places a second phosphate on fructose 6-phosphate. And ATP is a negative effector and AMP is a positive effector of the enzyme phosphofructokinase. Then there is a feedback inhibition. Allosteric inhibitions are the basis of feedback inhibition. So with feedback inhibition, product late uh, in a series of enzyme catalyzed reactions serve as an inhibitor of the previous allosteric enzyme early in the series. So you have enzyme E1. So there is A giving rise B, B gives C, C, D and E and F. So enzyme 1. Uh, so this F product could be the negative feedback inhibitor for the enzyme 1. If it is attached to the E1, so it will not let produce B, so further erection will not happen. So this will be your negative feedback allosterism. Yeah. Then there is a positive allosterism in this. Uh, for example, activation is seen in the binding for oxygen molecules to the hemoglobin. So hemoglobin is composed of four distinct subunits and can bind up to four oxygen molecules, HbO8. So as each oxygen molecule binds, it changes the conformation of the hemoglobin and increases its affinity for the oxygen. And this ensures that hemoglobin will transport the maximum amount of oxygen from oxygen rich areas. And conversely, the release of an oxygen molecule decreases the hemoglobin affinity of oxygen, promoting its release in the tissue. So proenzyme, an enzyme made in an active form, it is converted to its active form, so by proteolysis. So when needed at the active site in the cell, so pepsinogen is synthesized and transported to the stomach where it is converted to pepsin. So proenzyme of the digestive tract includes proelastase, trypsinogen, chymotrypsinogen, pepsinogen, uh, procarboxypeptidase. So there are the activators like trypsin, 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 chymotrypsin, acid pH, pepsin, trypsin. So enzyme includes allostase, trypsin, chymotrypsin, pepsin and so on.
then there is a protein modification that is in protein modification a chemical group is covalently added to the removed from the protein and covalent modifications either activates or turns off the enzyme the most common form of protein modification is addition or removal of phosphate group so this group is located at the alkyl group with a free of hydroxyl group which include serine threonine and tyrosine so inhibition of enzyme activity so chemical can bind to enzymes and eliminate or drastically reduce catalytic activity they classify enzyme inhibitors on the basis of reversibility and competition so irreversible inhibitors bind tightly to the enzyme and thereby prevent formation of es complex reversible competitive inhibitors often structurally resemble the substrate and bind at the normal active site reversible non competitive inhibitors usually bind at some place other than the active site and binding is weak and thus inhibition is reversible in that so basically irreversible and reversible and reversible are two competitive and non competitive in the irreversible uh, it will not let the enzyme reaction to happen but in reversible it will it might happen um so this could be also competitive and non competitive and the irreversible inhibitors they bind very tightly to the enzyme so they act as like uh, the same shape of a substrate so binding of the inhibitor to one of the r group of amino acids in the active site and this binding may block the active site binding group so that enzyme substrate complex cannot form so alternatively an inhibitor may interfere with the catalytic group of the active site eliminating the catalysis and irreversible inhibitors includes arsenic snake phenom and nerve gas on the other hand reversible competitive inhibitors they includes your enzyme inhibitors uh, called structure analogs such as molecules that resemble the structure and charge distribution of the natural sub substance of the enzyme and resembles permits the inhibitor to occupy the enzyme active site so once inhibitor is at active site no reaction can occur and the enzyme activity is inhibited so inhibition is competitive because the inhibitor and the substrate compete for the binding to the active site then degree of inhibition depends on the relative concentration of enzymes and inhibitor whereas a reversible non competitive enzyme inhibitor they bind to the alkyl group of amino acids so this binding is quite weak enzyme activity could be reduced when the inhibitor dissociate from the enzyme and these inhibitors do not bind to the active site and they do not modify the shape of the active site also and this is called protolytic enzymes so they are they cleave the peptide bonds actually so there is alanine phenylalanine and glycine so there is a peptide bond between two amino acids so these enzymes are one which break down this bond so these enzymes specificity depend upon the hydrophobic pocket Chymotrypsin, for example, cleaves a peptide bond at the carboxylic end of methionine, tyrosine, tryptophan, and phenylalanine. And some of the applications of these enzymes in medicine, such as they could be used in the diagnostic enzyme level, like we have just discussed today, in the heart attack, uh, like lactoid dehydrogenase, creatinine phosphate (SGOT), then pancreatitis, like amylase and lipase. we can analyze some reagents for example urea converted to ammonia via urease replacement therapy uh, in the case of gaucher disease so we can say that these enzymes are uh, correspondingly actually helping in this biochemistry part also so whatever we have discussed today um, in our upcoming lectures yeah so we have discussed first the basics of your um, dna and rna because that's the basic part that we want to do then we discuss some virtual labs then we discuss into the more core concept of your um, biochemical units then today we understand after understanding the basic concept of these biomolecules uh, then we went for the uh, more core biomedicinal concept about it and in order to uh, work these concept so we have understood also the enzymatic structure the how enzymes are playing role behind them so in order in in overall uh, during these 
um, three days um, we have completed like almost uh, three or three units we can say from the BSc level yeah we have completed around 80 percent of your syllabus of bio medicinal biochemistry during three days so I hope um, you have enjoyed the time here with me and you have learned a lot um, within this short period of time from 3 to 5 Friday Saturday and Sunday and you will get the certificates out of it don't worry you all will get the certificates for the same and uh, yeah so that's it uh, for today um, then all wish you all the best for the future and we have finished that's I was thinking that we might not able to finish everything on time but uh, it was possible so any questions anything you want to be in touch you can type me in the chat box in the in the in the whatsapp or here so we can discuss that so other than that uh, we are done with the session and we are open to the questions anything you want to ask anything that i could be helpful i will be happy to answer it Okay, if not, then wish you all the best um, for the future. Take care. Yeah, study hard. Uh, do achieve your dreams, and be in inexplicable. Yeah, be like someone um, that you will be a source of motivation, and inspiring. Yeah, thank you very much for being there. Wish you all the best. Thank you. Bye bye.